All right, dudes, <clears throat> let's try to get into another video. It's been a while. This one's going to be a little bit different, but for anybody who's in the TC, if you know what that is, then that applies to you. Um, basically, I've always flexed it, which is meshing. So hopefully this isn't a long video, but we're going to talk about how to mesh, why you should do it, and some tricks that I've learned myself when it comes to meshing. So yeah, first thing you're gonna need is Blender because Blender is a free, it means you don't have to pay for anything. When I was first meshing, I did have to pay for another software, which is 10 times easier, but this is free. Everyone's gonna be using this. A lot of Roblox developers use this, so you should use this. It's, it's great now that I know how to use it, but anyway, point is you need Blender. Blender is free. I'm, I'm pretty sure you can get it on Mac, but I'm not a Mac user. I feel like people should use real computers. No offense. But uh, anyway, point is, uh, we're gonna try to mesh. And I don't mean we're gonna model something. I mean, we're going to take an existing build that we have in Roblox and try to make it so that we can lower the part count in a sense. Now, what I'd like to stress is that even though you will mesh something, does not mean that it in turn, like it, it's going to lower your part count in game, right? But you may not know this, but there is something called a polygon count, which is basically like how many little triangles it takes to create your 3D piece. So if you want to see what I mean, because, you know, you might think that I'm bullshitting. If we go to view and we click this, you will see all the little triangles that make up our 3D model. So now, these little triangles, right, there is a limit to how many of these little triangles you can have in one piece, in one Roblox part. Now, over the years, Roblox has raised it little by little. I mean, when I first started doing, like, mesh work, it was like 5,000, then they raised it to 10,000, I believe. Could be wrong. Then it went from 10,000 to 20,000 with the new 3D importer. I'm sure eventually they plan on letting uh, even more parts slide. Uh, another thing that you need to know is that just because the 3D importer lets you import with things that are higher than the limit doesn't mean that your model is ineffective. Even one polygon off can cause your model to go from a high quality detailed model like this one to a low quality piece of garbage. You don't know what I mean by that. The point is when you surpass the limitation Roblox will try to lower the polygons, which is the little triangles, tries to lower it so that it can still be imported into Roblox. Now, what that means is that all these little curvy bits that I added to my face may get removed or they may look a little weird now. If you're okay with that, then, you know, let it be you. But there is a limitation. The limitation is 20,000. Now, in this video, I'm going to show you different ways to kind of keep it below that limitation. But just know, I'm going to say it right now, because I'm teaching you how to do this, that means that um, there are going to be cheat sheets that I've created for myself, which I will not be giving out because uh, I feel that, first of all, you know, it's my little cheat sheet. It's my little, it's how I, you know, make sure that the, that the kettle knows that, you know, where they belong, the lower class. <laughs> but in all seriousness... You should learn how to script and how to do these things for yourself for yourself. If I keep handing it to you, you're not going to learn anything. I'm teaching you how to mesh, but if you want to learn how to mesh efficiently, you should be the one looking for different methods and different ways for you to do that. Exactly. So if I pause the recording, let's say, to do something or like do a little cheat sheet, or if I run like a, a command in the command bar and you see that it's done fast, Yes, it's it, it's definitely an unfair cheat sheet, but listen, homie, listen. When I was first starting, I, I saw I saw like an old jit, but like when I first started out, homeboy, this was tough, you know. Like I had to do this by hand, so y'all gonna have to struggle too. I, I hate to break it to you. Anyway, almost five minutes of the video here. First thing, like I said, get Blender. Don't know the website, but if you look up uh, Blender 3D modeling. Uh, you will find it. It's like the only 3D modeling software called Blender. 
Uh, secondly, obviously you're going to need Roblox Studio and what exactly you're trying to mesh. Now, you could do an entire big-ass building if that's what you want to do. But just know that there are steps you need to take beforehand is what I'm going to say. Now, there are different things that you should kind of keep an eye out for. Uh, you may not see it, right, because uh, Roblox is one thing, but... Uh, the reality of how Roblox functions in other 3D, model, 3D modeling software is very apparent. Um, things like textures, right? So if you don't know what a texture is, or, or like decals, for those who know. Uh, what Roblox does is that effectively it makes like another little 3D... It's, it's technically 2D, but the way it appears in a 3D model is sort of 3D. Uh, and it what, what it does is basically it makes like another it makes like an outline around whatever you put it on and then applies the texture onto that which in turns looks to us because of how roblox handles it looks to us like it's sitting on the surface of whatever you put it on when in reality it's not so because of that reason what we need to do firsthand is we need to set up our you know whatever we're meshing right we need to set it up so that basically, um, I don't know, I don't know the word for it. We need to set it up basically, right? So that all the textures, decals are removed, and so that there aren't any extra polygons in place, right? I'm not going to show you what it looks like when you have a texture on there. You want to experiment for yourself, go right ahead. But I'm not going to, you know, show you that. However, what I can say is, uh, you should trust me because I have more experience than you. And if you don't, then just uh, jump off a bridge. All right? Thanks. Anyway, let's get into the video. This is my R160 face. As you can see, there is one LED headlight and one regular one. May have different options here and there. Uh, and this is like my fifth time re-recording this video because there's always a problem. So that's great. But anyway, here's what we're going to do. And I'm going to kind of, I guess I'll show you a little bit of what I mean by the texture. You see how this has a decal on it? This, in, in like, if, if I were to export this, you'll see an extra 2D thing around this. And that's what the texture is actually sitting on. So it's not what it looks like here. Anywho, we're going to try to set up this model. The first thing you need to do is you need to separate the parts and pieces of things that you know for a fact you're not going to use. So this face, for example, this headlight is already separate, right? But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move it just over here just so that we can, like, separate different things. And I'll, eh, no, no, I'll just move it enough so that everything can kind of fall into place, I guess. Uh, you know what? All right. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, like, undecisive. Indecisive, that's the word. All right. So I'm selecting the headlights because I don't want this to be a part of the mesh because then we won't be able to turn them to neon parts, which is what we want our headlights to be. So this is going to be separate. We're going to move it over here. Oh, wait. We're also going to move the destination sign up here, which I know for a fact is called front. So do that from the Explorer. Glass pieces need to go as well. So we're just going to move this here. Uh, there you go. That's glass. And there is a glass there. Nice. We're going to move that in here like that. And that really should be it. There shouldn't be anything else. Um, oh, these you don't really have to remove, but I just like to do it just to do it. Uh, these are attachments. I have stopped using these as of two months ago because when you do beams, uh, Roblox doesn't know how to respond to beams. So, like, they glow in the dark, basically. It could be dark as hell, and it looks like it's – like it looks like an LCD screen, basically, is my point. So uh, I recommend you mesh your decals now. Don't uh, do beams unless you're really trying to save on part count, I guess. But even then, it's just, it looks weird is my point. Uh, if you don't know what I mean by that, if I go inside this train, right? Let's look at this ad right here. If I, if I were to delete this light, right? And I made it pitch black outside, which you'll see here in a minute. It's already pitch black almost. Like this, and then straight up dark. The ads are still glowing. This in real life, you wouldn't, you know what I mean? Like this, this is not, you would not see this like this. So anyway, hopefully that uh kind of makes sense as to why I stopped using them. So next thing, this 
it, this one's a weird one. <clears throat> now in Roblox, if you export this with the old textures, not the 2022 textures, it will re-import <clears throat> with it. But we're gonna make that a separate mesh. Okay. <clears throat> now, before we start to <clears throat> export something, first thing I need to explain, these ropes that are here, these do not export. This is a Roblox thing. When you export this, this is not gonna be there. So if you think it is, it's not going to be. And you don't want it to be, because that the amount of polygons that probably takes is insane. <clears throat> Next thing you need to know is that we're going to set up a quote-unquote option for this. So what do you mean by option, you may ask? You see these yellow anti-slip uh, painted areas? These are on the real 160, but not all of them have it. When they first came in, they did, but not all of them have them today. Now, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to make it through the texture that this is removable. I know it sounds like black magic, but it's not. And you're going to sort of understand what I mean by that. We're going to go through it like step by step. And the reason I want to explain it is because I want to give you guys the power to use this as a means to save part count for yourselves and also kind of like a neat little trick for it too. So this saves on part count and you, you'll understand what I mean uh, when we get to it and I, like I explain it. So <clears throat> first order of business, we need to get these parts effectively. Uh, we're going to, oh yeah, it's because I moved this. We're gonna move this in here. This is our other model. This is stuff that we're gonna move back when it's fully meshed, basically. Okay. <clears throat> uh, yep, yeah, nope, that's good, perfect. So next thing we're gonna do, and this is where it's gonna get a little tedious. This script I may release, I might. So, I created a script that does this for me, but before, when I was doing it, I would have to go part by part, renaming the part, to the color so one this is that this color is this or name it this uh where is the name i'm blind like that you see and i would have to do that manually one by one for every part so this has a total of 69 parts i would have had to do this 69 times what a coincidence uh over and over again basically now you may want to do that but i don't want to do that so your boy, your homeboy, your compadre, aka me, I released, uh, or not released it, but I made a script that basically does it for me, and we're going to open it with Clip Clip. First thing you need to do to utilize the script is make a object value, so you do it by clicking this little plus, type in the word object value, and just click this, and it'll insert one, and just name it to which model in uh, caps, and select the model that you're exactly trying to, you know, work on. So I'm going to click the value and I'm going to find the model here. Or I could even just click it in the Explorer like that. But the thing is, when you do that, it's going to select the part. Which is why you would, it's better if you do it this way. So now, this is the front model. I've confirmed that this front model is the one that I want to work on. You could also just name it like, click this one. This, and then just like find it in the Explorer. Or like if you click this, right? And type in here, click this. Click this, and then you'll find it. Boom, done, you know? <clears throat> anyway, this is the model that we want to work on, right? So now, here's the next part that we're going to do. This is the first script that we're going to do, okay? What this script will do is that it will find the color of each part and then create different models based on the color so that if it shares the same color, it's in the same model with the other one. So what we'll do here is this. We're going to run a command. If you don't have this down here, which is usually on by default, it's here in view, command bar. We're going to click Control-C, Control-V on my script here. Press Enter. And as you can see, it made all these different models for me, which are just different colors. This is a good like point to find uh, colors that you could probably try to minimize. So like 119, 119, 121, this is a useless color to me because I could put this in 120 and nobody would notice the difference, right? So this is gonna go in here. And I'm also going to recolor it to 120, 120, 120, just for the sake of doing that. Because again, no one's gonna, I'm, I'm going to turn on like use part color and you're gonna see there's no real difference. 
it just looks a little more gray. But even then, it's one of those things that you could sacrifice the color. It's really not going to be that big a deal. This, you simplifying colors, is just going to make it easier on you. Because at the end of the day, it's less models or like less UV mapping you have to do in the long run. You'll understand what I mean by that in a second. <clears throat> 111, 110, 113. I could probably put this in 110, 110, 110 and get away with it. So we're going to do this, do this. And it already has part color on. You can just see it just makes it a little less blue. You might not be able to see it, but it just makes it like a little less blue. It's like more gray, basically. Anyway, that's one less model. Uh... 163, this one is a weird one. I don't know if I, oh yeah, definitely, let me see. Why is this one a different color than this? So you see that, that's an inconsistency we found there. So this is gonna be changed to this color. There you go, now it's matching. That's another less one. Usually things like this 110 and 120, I keep them because it, it's, 10 of any value is, is like a significant value enough. But if it's like 5, it's like a big maybe. really depends. I'm going to leave it just because. But just look at like colors that are very close to each other. Like even these two colors here. You could probably get away with it. Let me see. This is the outline, right? Yeah, I, I could get away with this. So I'm going to put this down here. Get the color of this. And just do that and delete this one. Good. And then that's all we need. This one, I need this because it's like a little blue and it, it gives the outline. So you can see the back part of it. So we're going to keep that one. But basically, you, you get the gist as to what we're doing here. Just trying to summarize our colors a little bit. If it's like one part that has one color, you try to like blend it in with another one. Because at the end of the day, it's one of those things that you rather sacrifice colors just to make it easier on the texture that you're going to make. The next script is going to name the part, uh, the, the parts their color. So see how this is called meshes, fbex, whatever. This next script is going to basically just name it what it is. So 110, 110, 120. We're going to need this in Blender because when we export this, we want to be able to see what color it is without having to go through any other properties. And this is the script that I'm not going to release. Because uh, I suck as a human, so don't worry. Uh, I made a script that basically makes the texture for me. Uh, effectively, we're going to <laughs> move this out of here so that you guys don't see it. <laughs> basically, what I'll do, right? <laughs> you guys are going to have to do this in Bay.net. But basically, what I used to do, and this is this is painstakingly, I would go, right, find the model, so this one, and then 110, 110, 110, right? I would go into the into the color, find the hex value, copy it, okay, go into paint.net, right, and then paste the hex value here, make a square, all right, put the square right here in the corner, all right, sick, all right, cool, and then go over, whoops, go over here, okay, next color, okay, yeah, get the hex value here, all right, next, next little next little brick Weep. like this yeah i don't do this anymore because you know the lord gave me patience but it wears very thin very fast so i created a script that basically and anyone who could recreate it i would be okay with you releasing it again but basically what it does is i i turn i made a little ui for it if i run it you'll see what it'll do for me it makes the colors for me, homie, and it puts the colors where they belong. Come on. Come on. Like, what, what? Dude, the greatest scripter on planet Earth, in the TC at least. Anyway, <clears throat> back to the point. What we're going to do here, now that I have used a cheat sheet that's going to piss off everybody, I'm just going to quickly <laughs> screenshot this with no shame. Nice. We're going to paste it here. And we're going to do this like that. I'm just going to like neatly crop this. Uh, yeah, yeah, it looks right. Just like that. And boom. Look at that, bud. Come on. 
Come on. I saved myself like 20 minutes worth of texturing right there. Boom. So watch this. You see this yellow right here, right? This yellow is going to be interesting because what we're going to do is that we're going to... I'll just explain. Basically, you see how it's yellow, right? With the new surface appearance property uh, or uh, instance in Roblox, I can make it so that if it's yellow like this, it shows up. But if I remove it and I make it transparent like this, then it disappears suddenly. And we want that because, again, not all 160s have this yellow strip in the front. So... You see, we're kind of cooking up something here, low key. All right, all right. Now comes the next step. Obviously, we made our texture. We're gonna save it. So I'm gonna save this as R160 uh, tex texture face option. It's a weird name, but you know, it works. We're done with paint.net officially here, by the way. We can close that out now. Next part of this, we're going to export this. Now, if I export it from this current position in Blender, I would have to do an entire scavenger hunt to find where exactly this is in Blender. So to avoid that, to avoid that, what we're gonna do is we're going to place this at position 000, which is the exact center of Roblox, right? So when we do that, it's also gonna be the exact center of Blender effectively. So the way we could do that very easily here is just basically basically this value, the origin, but you need to reset it like the pivot point because sometimes it can like sometimes it can be weird is my point. So to avoid that I think what we should do is just put this at zero 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 and pray to god that it sits in the center now there's another model here uh that i did from the previous meshing so we're just gonna remove that and now it's just this one now as you can see that old one was there because i had made the video in the past so now here's what we'll do i wanted to see how can I, I wonder, how can you see, hmm. all right, you know what, we're going to assume, hello, okay, yeah, no, it is, <laughs> it is using my, uh, it's using my, <laughs> my blue Yeti mic, not, not my, not my headset mic, it probably sounds like freaking Walmart, all right, we're going to export this from this position, basically. Export selection, and we're going to do R160 face. Sick. It's going to buffer for a little bit. Once this is done, you'll see it'll disappear from here. Once it's completely gone, basically, we'll just check in Blender, and we'll see. There you go. It's done. Perfect. When you open up a new place in Blender, all of these things are going to show up. We don't want any of this, so just press the letter A and delete. And here, we're going to go to File import an obj obj which is the object file we're going to find our model which i put it in downloads here it is at r160 face and we're going to split by group do not forget to toggle this part import and now you can see it imported with separate pieces hence why we needed to click on uh separate by group i think is what it, it was uh, is what it's called now, obviously, uh, our R160 face looks absolutely amazing. There are things missing on it, like the door handles, but we don't talk about that. Uh, anyway, <laughs> back to the point. We brought it into Blender. First part of our meshing process is basically completed. The next part of this is going to be a little confusing, so try to keep up. Just replay the video or like go back if you need. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to UV map this now. UV mapping is the art of taking this, right, this piece, and applying a color to it. Now, it looks like it has it already because it exported with the Roblox materials. But if I re-imported this entire thing, you would basically see right off the bat that this isn't going to import properly. It's all gonna be one color instead of all the different colors that we see here in Blender. 
Uh, another thing is too, when you import it into Blender, you can see different things that may have not separated. So these white boxes down here aren't white boxes because they're not part of the right model or because it's a union. So this gives you a chance to kind of go back and fix the model if need be. So obviously these are three different colors here, which you know we, we know now. Boom, boom. This is still 17, 17, 17. So we're going to name it that. This is going to be, this is basically 60, 60, 60. So we'll move this into 60, 60, 60. And name it as such. 60, 60, 60. Basically. And then this is 160, 160, 160, which is conveniently a model that we have. So we're going to name that 160, 160, 160. Perfect. Now we can re-export this again, and we should have all of our colors proper now. Yes. Let's delete this. Press A and delete. Basically import the same thing again. Make sure that, uh, I think I pressed export this time. Whoops. Import. There we go. Split by group. See, now it's white. And all the other little colors are there too. Sick. Here comes the next part about this. This is going to be the part that's a little tedious. Not really tedious, just annoying. So <clears throat> this is the UV editing uh, part of this. You'll see this on the top here. And what we're going to do is basically load our image. So the image that we made with all the different colors, which is R160 texture face option dot PNG. And there you go. Now we have our texture here. Now, we have to manually go color by color, putting it in and out of this program. So that's where I say it gets a little tedious. But, lucky for you, uh, we uh, can search in Blender, which is cool. So what we'll do is one by one find these numbers. So 163, 162, 165, and select anyone that has the same number here. So all of these parts are the same. And we will go press edit, press the letter A, which selects everything that you have in your edit menu. Remember, you have to be an edit. And then after that, press UV and project from view. I like to do it from the front view directly like this. I probably should not have done this because now people like Alex and Arlem over here, they're going to basically use this face as a means to recreate our assets, which is like, a super douchebag thing to do, by the way. You see how it's stretched? The reason it is, is because our picture is not a perfect square. Had it been a perfect square, it wouldn't look stretched, but it doesn't really matter because it doesn't need to be perfect for you to basically color it. So boom, there's the color there. We're going to put it back into object mode. What I like to do is I like to hide it because it's complete. So we finished that part already. Next part of this is 160, 160, 160. Sometimes you don't even have to type out the whole number for you to find it. So there you go. Boom. Press the letter A. Project from view. Shrink it. Pressing S. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. You can select it. When it comes in here, press the letter S and just move your mouse in towards it. And it shrinks it, basically. Back into edit mode. Let's hide it. Next one is 30, 30, 30. There you go. Gonna, you got to click the little triangle, by the way. The, at least for the first one. And then the rest, you can just click the, the name. Edit, press the letter A, Ooh, press the letter A, UV, project from view, press the letter S to shrink, back into 30, 30, 30. And basically, that's like the whole process of it. Uh, I'm going to try to... I don't know how to pause a recording, so never mind. I was going to, but we'll try to just thug this out and do it quick, basically, I guess. <laughs> All right. So 30, 30, 30, we got that done. Press the letter H to hide it. Uh, next one is 90, 90, 90. There's only one 90, 90, 90, nice. Which is the anti-climber, sick. Project from view. And you have to click on this side, by the way, in order for you to get it. There you go, put it here. Next one is 170, 170, 170. Two parts there, oh wait, hold up. We want to we wanna get out of edit mode with this one and hide it. If you're in edit mode and then you try to go back, it's basically, it's going to select the last thing you had selected too. So always make sure that you hide it and like click on the outside and then come back in and then select the new part. So 
project from view sweep 170 170 170 doesn't need to be perfect just in the square basically yeah we're gonna we're gonna breeze through this is gonna be easy 91 93 there you go boom 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 this is the little tail light piece it's a lot of polygons for that holy crap let me see oh because it's a ah oh, damn okay I should probably fix that. Doesn't matter though. It's still cool. Still cool. Edit uh, object mode. Bring it out. 17, 17, 17. Boom, boom. And we're going to put it into edit mode again. Select what we need to select. Project from view. Boom, just like that. Hide it. Next one is 110, 110, 110. See, we're, I'm, I'm breezing through this. I'm, I'm just so used to doing it. Just like that boom and then project from view boom done this is really this is, doesn't take a rocket scientist you know what i mean like this is something that anyone can do doesn't really what i would recommend is that instead of having a developer who simply models you just have a guy whose job is just to mesh and like it gives the developer who models or who builds to continue building other stuff you have a guy designated to mesh and See, I do multiple jobs, right? So does Cast, who's my other developer. But what it should be like is that we have someone who's, whose job is only to mesh so that we can focus on other projects. Because this could be very time-consuming. The more parts you have in your train, the more detail you intend to add to it. So it could get annoying. But if you have a guy whose job is solely to mesh, which I'm sure after this video, you're going to find uh, strictly mesh developers, which I'm all I'm all about it. Uh it's, it's going to save you time in the long run, especially especially if you have a, a guy who is dedicated to meshing. Like, in the sense, he's not going to try to BS you. He's actually going to mesh whenever you ask him to. Like, you will have the, the upper hand on everyone because now that I'm making this video, now that a lot of people are going to know how to do it, you could, sit, you could have four guys whose job is to mesh. You could have a train done it mesh, like being meshed in an hour. And that's insane because for me, before, especially before all the little tricks that I made for myself, could have taken weeks. Okay, it, it, not because it takes a long time, but because you get just unmotivated from doing it. So I, I, I don't, I don't mean to have some dudes hating like, oh, you're just a lazy fuck. Like, yeah, you're right, I am, but it's annoying to do. Is my point. But hey, bro, to each their own. If you think that this is interesting, then do it for yourself, and you know. But I'm sure you will come to appreciate the advice I'm giving you. Definitely get someone whose sole purpose is to mesh. I'm telling you. It would have saved me so much time. Half my train projects would have probably been done by now. Because I, I now I model. Now I script. Now I... You know, it's a lot of jobs for one dude. So I just think that's something that we should uh, pay attention to and appreciate. Okay. We got done. And meshing, it, I mean, it's easy because of how I'm explaining it, but like I said, when I was doing it firstly, like nobody taught me this. I taught myself this. And actually, for those who didn't know, I used to work for Golden Bird. Like it's something that they made like an A and C lines or some shit. I used to work for them. And the first mesh project I did was for them. I had taken their leak trains and meshed it. And I brought it down from like 400 some parts to only like 50 like without the train wheels and stuff, like just 50 for the train alone. And uh, yeah, definitely got my fair share of glaze from that one, I'll tell you. Uh, okay, we just need the 120. You see how this showed up here? It's because there might be a union that also has the color 120 on it. So just make sure you don't accidentally select another model, you know. So I'm going to go back to edit mode, UV, project from view. We're almost done, by the way. We only have like a couple colors, three colors left. Nice. K H. Fifty, fifty, fifty. Boom. Oh, accidentally scaled it. Put it right there. Oh, we're almost done, boys. Okay, here we go. I just stopped hiding stuff because at this point, it's we only have like two left. There's no point. Uh, edit mode, click off, and then now 99, 95, 
98. Nice. Boom. It's our last little bit right here. Doom, doom, and doomy. Hit him with a zoomy. It's over. All right. We fully meshed our train, boys. All right. Press Alt H to make everything appear again. Here comes the next part of it. We're going to press the letter A. And you see how we have a, a yellow outline? That's what you want. If you don't have one, just click a random part like this. And it'll make that the main part that we're going to be attaching something to. And we're basically just going to right click and press the, the join button. Which basically makes all of this into one piece. You want that. Trust me. The next part we're going to do is that we're going to get our the information for our model, basically. Statistics here, right, which was under this second one. It's like two little circles inside of each other. Right here, statistics. What this tells me is that we have 33,000 of those little triangles we spoke about earlier. We obviously cannot have that. This is going to be two parts. So... If you want to be the guy who just randomly starts selecting it until you got exactly 20,000, like I would do, you can. But because this is just 20,000 parts and it's going to be two parts anyway, what I would prefer to do is just like cut it right in half like this. You can see we have 14,000 uh, uh, polygons. Sorry. We can press the letter P and select it and then separate it. And now we have two parts. This one's 19,000. This one's 14,000. It was going to be two parts anyway, so it doesn't need to be exactly it. But if you have a model that has like 100K, you would kind of want to just go poly by poly, like little triangle by triangle, getting it until it's exactly 20,000 so that you could get the most out of that one part. You'll see that especially when you're doing things like interiors where you have a lot of different colors, a lot of different parts, especially with poles. Uh, poles tend to be the things that have the most polygons in the interior. So when you do it, You'll have a 100K polygon model, but you want to split it up so that you have, let's say, uh, let's say 110K. You'll have five uh, pieces that are exactly 20,000 on the dot, and then one piece that's the last 10K. doesn't really matter if it's a perfect number, but you'd get the most bang, quote unquote, for your buck out of maximizing how many polys there is in one model. Now that we separated this, all I'm going to redo is rename it. So we're going to name it. Phase one, and this one is going to be phase two. Oh, let's get that uh, out of there. Okay, I am clearly dyslexic. And then we're going to export as a OBJ. Object groups enabled, because if you don't, it's going to export as one part, and that's not what we want. And I'm just going to replace the model that we brought from Roblox. And now comes the juicy part. You can delete this now. Although what I do want to do is, and I want to move it back to the position it was in, all the way over here, just so that I know where to uh, bring the new model. Sick. And then we're going to go to Home, Import 3D, which is this little globe with an arrow, and then select our mesh. As you can see, the mesh that we did is less, is less of a size than the one that we brought into Blender. And then what you want to do is, this, turn this off, this, leave this on, uh, anchored, and yeah. The reason you don't want to import only as a model is because if your mesh gets leaked and this is on, basically what's going to happen is you won't be able to archive the mesh traditionally. So never have this on because if you do, then your mesh is as good as screwed if it gets leaked. Press import. Sick. Now we have our two pieces. Nice. And just for comparison, if you would have exported this and then re-imported it, it would have looked like this all gray. So what we just did by putting every single color where it belongs, basically we can make it look like this without it being so many separate pieces. And to go back to what I was saying about how if it's over 20,000 polys, what it's going to do, I'm going to export it without object groups and I'm going to re-import it to the UC for yourself. And I won't even have to import it for you to see that it degraded the model. You see that the, the roof lining is kind of more square now. And if we rotate it, you can see the difference in quality from the model. I'm going to import it just so that you see kind of the differences. The UV mapping still does apply to this, but you'll see where it becomes a problem, I guess. So we're going to start applying our texture to these two parts. 
you see that it has a different name to it. This is the texture. There's really no way to avoid it naming this, so it is what it is. But you're going to, usually you can click texture ID, but remember we have an option on this where the yellow part can be removed. So what we wanna do is get a surface appearance. You click the little plus and then type surface appearance on it. We're gonna copy and paste it into the second one. And on color map, we're going to select our texture like this. And you should see, open sesame, there it is, nice. And we're going to just copy one of this now with the information, we're just gonna paste it into this one. And you can basically see what happens when you surpass the limit, what it's going to do. Obviously, unless you want your mesh looking like this, I mean, I, I wouldn't want it looking like this, but to each their own, I guess. Let's get that out of there. Um, okay, we have our mesh now. We have our surface appearance. What's next? We're going to turn alpha mode into transparency. It's gonna go white for a second, but this is working as it should. Now, what's going to happen here is, remember what I told you, we want it so that certain, let's say, certain R160s may have that yellow, some of them don't. And if you know how to script, you can basically say, I'm gonna make a script that if this card number has it, then it's going to switch the texture to this one instead of this texture, which has that yellow part transparent. So we'll go back into paint.net real quick. We're going to open this texture and we're basically going to delete it. We're gonna delete this entire yellow and we're gonna save it, just like that. Now, if I go here and I open this same texture in surface appearance, watch this, you're gonna see magic, boys. All of a sudden, that yellow, gone. Watch, abracadabra. Um. Hello? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Took a second, all right. And and the, the best part about this, and this is the part that I just find absolutely incredible, is that even though what it basically did is just made it invisible, it doesn't even show up here as if it's there. As far as the model's concerned, that doesn't even exist. So it does save on the polygon cart, uh, count as well. So two different options and all you have to do is switch a texture ID, really? That's insane. You could have curved poles and regular poles and just have it controlled by a texture and it saves you a ton of time in scripting. So that's basically the end of the video. You learned everything you needed to learn. Uh, Till next time, screw off.